think the most valuable thing someone can do is just be there and listen. It's free, doesn't cost anything, doesn't take much time. You know, one thing that I would do, um, you know, now we've been all stuck inside because of COVID, but it's really easy on the way home from work or while you're making dinner or whatever to just call someone and say, hey, how are you doing? Da, 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 da. And then, you know, just that 10 minute check in can make their life dramatically different if they were having a bad day. Hello and welcome to Grief, Gratitude and the Gray in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. Welcome to today's episode. Today I am chatting with Rachel Engstrom and we will be going on a journey with her, learning about her grief journey um, and everything in between, as I call it to the gray in between component mm -hmm. and all the gratitude that comes from that. So welcome Rachel to the podcast. And I was just um, apologizing to Rachel because I wrote down the wrong time on my calendar and she was patient enough to wait for me here on the um on the app so first off thank you again Rachel for that oh of course but happy Friday it's Friday it's just a wonderful <laughs> time that it's Friday <laughs> <laughs> well thank you okay so tell us a little where do you live yes I live in Minnesota um just outside of the Twin Cities outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul um, I've lived here for 20 and a half years. I moved here, I'll be 39 next month. I moved here when I was 18 to go to school at the University of Minnesota, not knowing one person. And I ended up creating quite an amazing life here. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, so tell us then about your husband and then just the um, the, the journey also of your of your family. Of what you've been sure, through. Sure, sure. So sophomore year of college, first semester, I went to a birthday party um, of uh, mutual friends of ours. And I met this guy that was tall and cute. And he was a, almost <laughs> about seven years older than me. And I thought, oh, no way could I date him. And we ended up dating and it was just wonderful. God totally had a plan. And um Three years later, when I was 22, right after I graduated from college, we got married and he worked nights. So I didn't get to see him a lot um, Monday through Friday, but the time that we had was amazing. And, you know, I was just given this nice opportunity to have security in our marriage, who I was, um, you know, my own life, work, friends, different things like that, while also being married. Um, kind of doing my own thing and being very independent during the weeks when he was working. And then when he was 35 and I was 28, um, he thought he had the flu one day and went to the doctor. And three days later, after different tests, we found out he had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Mm. So I had to learn very quickly how to navigate the cancer world, lots of trial and error. And within that, um, I learned so many different things, learned, you know, the different kinds of support that I needed. I didn't necessarily know the right kind at the time, mm -hmm. all those types of things. Um, and then when he got much better and then a year and a half after he was first diagnosed, we had to admit him again on the, actually the, it was a Monday in the summer. It was on the day of our eighth wedding anniversary. We had to admit him um, to the hospital because he had relapsed. And mm -hmm. after four grueling months of chemotherapy, the following January of 2013, he um, had a bone marrow transplant. And unfortunately all of the chemo and radiation to prepare his body for that just 
wrecked his kidneys and his bladder and his lungs, and he was in the ICU twice. And then ultimately his body just fell apart. So when I um, was two days from turning 31, I was told I'm sorry. And then on my 31st birthday, so it was a Wednesday when I was told I was sorry, April 17th. And then on my birthday, I turned 31 that Friday, the 19th. And they said, you know, we'll wait till Sunday. And then on Sunday, um, you know, I'm just fresh 31, my entire adult life as I know it is being his wife. And then I had to hold him and sign the papers and take him off life support. And then I had to reboot my life and figure out who I am, you know, on my own, starting over, totally did not plan this. And yeah, it was very, very difficult. Wow. Wow. Thank you for um, sharing that. I know it's hard. And also for the listeners, I know sometimes it's also hard to um, listen to these, you know, details and stories and journeys. But at the same time, I know that many can relate to the uncertainty and all these different tests that come, because that's why they tune into this um, episode, you know, to these, Mm -hmm. to this podcast, right? Um, Rachel, so he was only then 38 when he passed away. 37, yeah. He was 37 when he died. And Mm -hmm. had you guys, you had been married for eight years. Had you had any children? No, actually. um, (laughs) Along the way of him being ill... The year before he became sick, I was actually diagnosed with endometriosis where I had ovarian cysts, um, just cysts all over my reproductive organs. So I had my own surgeries and different things. Actually, the day of his transplant, three days before that, I had my own surgery to scrape off adhesions off Mm. like 26 sites. So we're both there medicated in pain Um, in the hospital. And then um, six months after he died, I just threw in the towel and actually had a hysterectomy because I was in so much pain. I could barely walk. So that was another type of grief as well as I had to give up the dream of having kids, let alone my husband. So no, I I did not have the luxury of having children. No. And I, I asked that. And by the way, my, I know that that's one of those things that when people are going through that journey Mm -hmm. of, you know, marriage, sometimes that's not a, that's not something they choose, right? They don't choose to have children. And sometimes it's just not, in their cards. And in your case, it wasn't. Yeah. And so, um, I, I, I apologize that I asked, but at the same time, I'm oh, glad no, I it's did. Fine. Cause if not, you would have not shared that you had also gone through that grief journey of the, um, uh, you know, hysterectomy and the, and all that. So thank you for sharing that. Now here you are young widow and having to have gone through that what were then some of these resources that you said, not only, of course, during the process of his diagnosis and his treatment, you had some type of support, share the type of support that was out there and which ones worked for you. Um, and then we'll also share that after then when he passed away, what are some of these um, tools you've used? Yeah. So the tricky thing was I was only 28 and you have to keep in mind, this is 10 years ago. And even though that doesn't sound that long ago, the amount of resources out there have, I'd want to say like quadrupled. Mm -hmm. Um, There were support groups and different things like that, but running back and forth, I was blessed enough that my parents um, that at the time had been married 48 years, something like that, 45 years they took shifts taking care of him, um, living with us full time. They took swapped and took shifts. Um, but running back and forth to the hospital and working was pretty much all I could do. So I didn't really have the luxury of having much time for support. What I did do is I'm not sure if it's something many people are familiar with here in Minnesota, there's a local company. It it is a global thing, but there's a website called Caring Bridge. It's like caringbridge, all squeezed together, dot org. So on there, you can sign up and you can create a blog. So then you can do updates for all the supporters and then they'll get emailed a newsletter. So that oh, was a yeah. really big thing for me. So in the book that I wrote, Wife, Widow, Now What, I actually have my Caring Bridge post, my Facebook post, all of it in chronological order with how I did it all. So like when I'm navigating insurance, when I'm trying to figure out treatment, diagnosis, how to support myself, how to support him, you know, emotionally, things like that. And then when people wanted to help, 
ways to actually tangible ways to tell people how to help. I have all of that. So I wrote like this love story toolkit for people to navigate a serious illness and grief and loss. Because when I was going through it, I was just doing the best that I could, but I was seriously burning the candle at both ends because just working full time, you know, we get home from work and we're tired. Right. But let alone having Mm -hmm. to go home, let the dog out, then run back to the hospital and do all of those things. It wasn't until I joined the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's team and training program a year after his diagnosis where I had no athletic ability to start besides, you know, walking my dog. I trained to do to walk a half marathon. And within that, I raised fifteen hundred dollars for blood cancer and trained alongside twice a week. Wednesday nights and then like seven in the morning for a couple hours every Saturday with people who had friends, family members, things like that, that had also gone through cancer. So within that, I was given a forum of people who got it might not Mm -hmm. be the same situation, might not be a spouse, but they authentically just wanted to listen to me vent or cry or talk or things like that. So I think for me, that was my biggest outlet. I did really have supportive friends and things like that. But the biggest support that I found was the team in training But also within doing those social media posts, you know, when people did a heart or said, we're praying for you or thinking of you of those things like that, that was like a virtual hug. So I think that that was a really good way. And that's a really good way people can connect these days as well. So those were the the basis of the big kinds of supports I had during that time that you did that. And now you, you, you touched on several things. You touched on the fact that you started to do the, um, that you started to do these, okay. Was it like five Kate's out or mar- or full on uh, It was marathon. a half marathon. So it was half 13 marathon, miles I had to train for. <laughs> That's amazing. And now you still keep doing those and raising money on the, for these, correct? I actually, I haven't done that in several years, but right now I'm actually running for woman of the year for the state of Minnesota, where I am trying to raise $60,000. I'm racing it 10 weeks. I'm racing virtually, not physical race against six other people to raise as much money as possible for blood cancer for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So I'm still um, involved in the philanthropic part of trying to advocate for people. So there are less widows, there are less losses and things like that. That's wonderful. Thank you for doing that. That's a, yeah. that's a great way of bringing awareness. And now take us to the journey of your book. So wife, widow, now what? Mm-hmm. Now what? <laughs> right? So, now, so it's you like, just basically just like, you just kind of like, just like, blah, 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 you just said it in the minute. So I was writing my book blah, 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 and you just kind of said it. And I did not introduce you as author in the, in this introduction. No, it's okay. Probably, it's okay. Mostly because I'm like all like, flustered that I was running late. So please tell us about your, your yeah. book and how is that process of writing your, this whole story, as you said, also like a, a toolkit really too, as well. Yeah. So the tough thing is when you're going through something this catastrophic, um, even just like the illness, you're thinking like, okay, I don't want them to die. I, you know, I like you're thinking one, I don't want them to die Two, I need to get treatment and three, like crap, I have to balance work and then money and da, 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 da. So it's a toolkit based on how to navigate all of those things, because I spent hours and hours and hours and I have my master's in social work. So I'm kind of a research nerd. So I knew how to do parts of that, but I had to look really hard because I mean, you know, insurance doesn't cover parking passes and gas and, you know, meals in the cafeteria at the hospital and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So I have, you know, how to navigate it, budget sheet, ways to think about stuff, ways, you know, friends and family can support you, things to ask. Because after he died, I just thought like, well, crap, it was so hard. You know, I'm talking about like a year after he died, I was more reflective on if I had to do this again, or if I had to connect with someone who's in this, whether it's the illness part or the widow part, where do you even start? Like, Mm. you know, just trying to balance children and, you know, it's, it's still tough to today. It's in April next month, he will have been gone eight years, but it's still tough this day. I can't have my own children, but let alone when you think about people that are balancing their grief with having children, with all of those things, in a way, I feel like it was easier for me because I didn't have to, I had the luxury of just being me. Um, you know, so there are the pluses and minuses there of not having children. But 
within that, I was thinking, I need to write all this down because there are so many different avenues, so many different facets of what your experience is like. But within that, you do, everybody has the financial part. Nobody really talks right. about that. They talk about treatment. They talk about the illness, but finances are a really big part of it. How to get this right kind of support because people want to help when someone's sick, when someone dies, they want to help, but they don't really necessarily know how to help in the right way. I mean, the worst, and I'm sure you've talked about it on this, but like one of the worst things people can say to a widow is like, I know how you feel. My aunt died or my mom died or my sibling died. And it's like, no, thanks. But that's mm -hmm. not the same. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, so I yeah, wanted. You can only say like you can relate. I, I always say this, even if it's the same debt, even if it is, let's say I was a widow and I was saying, I can't say I know how you feel. I don't know. <laughs> I can only say I can relate to what you're going through right? It's like, I can relate to it. I can't say I know, you know, because it, you, even if it was the same thing, you just know certain aspects of it, but you don't know the whole story of that individual. Correct. Like it's, yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. But what you're saying in terms of the financing component, all that part and the support, it's like, that is something that you're so right. Like that's not something that everybody would have to go, um, thinking about, for example, if it's like your, I don't know, like if it's not like your spouse, like, and then you're also, you know, you, cause you would then have also the financial responsibilities of your own now life that used to be too, right? Like yeah. all these, you know, it's so, so many layers. Okay. So go on. Sorry to interrupt you there. No, no, no. It's really true because I mean, the, the things that people really truly need when someone is ill or they die, you don't think about like target cards or gasoline cards or, you know, those types of things mm -hmm. because all the expenses really do add up. And it's one of those things where people don't know how to adequately help. So I list how to navigate all of it, the, the helpful, tangible things you can do. You know, we had neighbors that cut our grass. We had people that when, you know, one time we needed to go to the hospital and they, we had a big snowstorm and they helped shovel our cars out. Like things like that, when you have people aware of what's going on within your world and know the ways that they can be the most helpful, that makes your level of stress, your level of grief, all those kinds of things a little bit easier. It doesn't make mm -hmm. it go away, but it makes it a little bit easier. And I think, you know, when people are I help facilitate a couple um, serious illness caregiver groups right now in my life for local organizations here. And one, you know, I was bringing that up that I talk about that in my book. And this woman was like, yeah, you know, her husband's been really sick for five years. And she's just like, people want to help. And I don't even know what to tell them because I'm just so tired. So, you know, it's, it's those types of things that when you're going through something so difficult, you can't even think of what you need when you need it. So I decided to write all this. And with a lot along with that, I'm processing in the book, it's all in real time, which is pretty cool because you could see like one day I'm like, after he's died, I'm like, it's been three months and I can't believe how, you know, great I feel today. And the next day I'm like, I can't stop crying. That is the, I love that because it is, it just shows that roller coaster of emotions in real time. Technically yeah. In real time and it right is, there. it's up and down. And the thing about grief is like, it's like riding a roller coaster where yes. you get on the ride, they put the bar down and you can't get out. It's going to go up the hill. It's going to go down the hill and you just have to ride it. You have to yes. surrender to it. I agree. Because if you don't, I, it's not, it's going to come out in other ways, sometimes at inappropriate times or, you know, you just have I, to go with it. I agree. I've, I even did a post one time about that, exactly that. And even just with the roller coaster, a lot, it, it, this goes back to the comment you made regarding somebody saying, I know how you feel. So I, I put this post of um, our family on a roller coaster ride and I forget which amusement park, I think Disneyland or something. Mm -hmm. And each, you know, the pictures they take when you're coming down that bit, you yeah. know, whatever bit. Okay. So my husband had one expression. My daughter had a completely different one. My son had like his eyes closed and I was like, ah, <laughs> like with my arms up, like smiling sure. and everybody different. And then I've commented, it's like, we were all on the same ride 
-hmm. yet our experience of it was different. So right. therefore, even even in a family dynamic that the same that they you've lost the same person or relationship in terms of like how the parents deal with it, how your parents deal with it, it's the same, you know, they're missing the same person, but each one of everybody's experience is different. And that roller coaster, what you mentioned before, the bar is down, you're on it, you know that there's going to be ups and downs, but you mm -hmm. do not necessarily always know when they're going to come. It's like being in right. like Space Mountain and it's dark and you don't know. You don't know. Okay. I so always then say grief bites you in the butt. Like it's like a <laughs> nasty bug. You least it can, you don't know when it's coming. <laughs> But I do have in my book, like anniversaries, holidays, birthdays, ways to prepare yourself and different ways to think about support and ways to ask for help because you do need to be adequately supported. And, you know, you need to adapt and reroute the traditions that you had, you know, because create new ones. So I have recommendations of things to do. So it's not like, Obviously, there are gaping holes in certain things the first several years, but ways that you can go on with positivity because, you know, it's doable and I'm eight years out and I am wonderful. I am healed, but it took a lot of work to get here. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us then, what are some of those ways? Like, how did you honor his first birthday that first year? Like, how was that? And of course, I'm sure it's different maybe now every year and this coming, you know, birthday will be maybe different. Yeah. So how did you, know, you honor... That What's birthday, interesting is, like I said, when he died, I was 31. When I turned 37, I actually had a panic attack and couldn't stop crying. And it was like six years after he died and I couldn't realize what it was. And then I finally realized later in the day, like I started panicking around like 9 a.m. I realized maybe around like four. I just I couldn't fathom or understand what was happening. I was going to surpass him in age. So that was just so like, it's just not fair. This is awful, you know, things like that. So what I would do for his birthday and for the anniversary of his death is I would do things with people from, so in my book, Rachel 1.0 is when he's alive. Rachel 2.0 is literally like after he's died and I walk out the door of his hospital room because mm -hmm. my life starts over. I'm a widow at that point. So I always planned this was like the like this year on april 21st on his birthday i'm working it's eight years out i'm good um doesn't mean it won't be a little bit difficult maybe but what i've done all the years leading up is for the both of those things is i would spend time and do something fun with people from rachel 1.0 that knew him so like mm -hmm. mutual friends of ours things like that my sisters have come out a couple times because we all live in different states you know, the first year, because my birthday is two days before he died, I had a big party. Then we like went to the zoo here with my sisters. So I just make sure that I, I, during those times that I've done something fun, um, the first Christmas after he died, I was totally fine. I actually dated someone for six months that was more like just light a cane on the wound, um, <laughs> kind of denying it all a little bit, but then, um, the second Christmas after he was gone, I went and had Christmas with my brother and his wife and their three kids and my sister and her husband and their daughter. And I just was not doing it's well. True. I was it's just true. trying to date all the time, fill an empty hole. I had bottomless hot chocolate with like amaretto in it, the liquor, like it was just denying it. So it's interesting how it just really is up and down and it's different and you can't pre-plan for it. I think the most important thing is to surround yourself with healthy relationships, healthy people. One difficult thing I did about a year or so after he died is I had a friend of 12 years that was my best friend. And she, um, I think this is really relevant because we all unfortunately at some point have toxic people in our life. And this person that had been friends with my husband and a best friend of mine just became really judgmental, really like, you know, it's time for you to do this. It's time for you to get a different, different job. It's time for you to decide to be happy. And it's like, she had no idea what I was going through. She was newly engaged, like all these things. And I was just like, I can't have this in my life. You know, I need positive people. So I think the biggest thing is just almost doing like a temperature check of your life throughout your grief process of where am I? Like, how do I feel about it? And what is 
what is it for me? Because you're right. Everyone's experience is so singular. You have to figure out, you know, what works best for you. And within my book, I write it. It's my story, my life, and then my recommendations of what I think would be really helpful for people because I, I've i cried thinking about how I wish I had a book like mine when I was going through it, but I'm writing it knowing everyone's experience is very different. Yes. Yeah, you're just, and that's the thing. It's like you give the tools that have worked for you. You give some recommendations of things that have worked for you. And if 10 people read it out of it say 10 people that out of the thousands that read it that those you mm -hmm. know pick maybe this one works for me or this one and some other ones it's going to be completely different what they take from it it's still a win because there's yeah. still somebody that's life is being changed just because of that um somebody will be related to you it, that's how I feel with yeah. this podcast. everybody's oh, sharing sure. a story differently and they're going to listen to one episode that's going to relate exactly to what it is that they are going through, you know, or what they yeah. need to hear. So that's wonderful. Now with all that, I, I really, um, like, uh, not, that's not the word like I was going to say, I admire the fact that you are able to be, um, truthful to yourself to know mm -hmm. that you were just in that aspect of denial for so long and just kind of like what you said, just covering the wound here and yeah. certain dynamics. So at what point do you feel it was more like, okay, really? No, I can't keep on doing this. I need to really feel these emotions as they're coming. Well, I was dating this guy and I haven't talked to him in, I don't know, like seven years, but like, God love him. Like I would be like, crying about my dead husband and then I'd be like do you want to make out and he'd be like no <laughs> and I think it was like those types of things that like it it sobered me up to what I'm doing isn't realistic what I'm doing is it was like the band-aid was falling off a little bit like it's just air was getting into the wound of almost like I was being mirrored um, and one of the things that I made myself do, I don't remember how earlier it was at what point, but I do remember making myself see, watch myself cry in the mirror and just going through the pain, going through that and just knowing and realizing like, it's okay. It's okay to go through this. It's okay for it to be ugly. It's okay. Um, just go with it. Just, just flow with it. Go with it. Don't let it, you know. I think when we deny ourselves um, of feeling that experience, it's just, it's going to pop up later. This sounds really gross, but um, <laughs> I wrote this in my book that like hiding your emotions or holding in your emotions is like holding in when you have to poop. Eventually your stomach's going to hurt really bad and you're not going to feel well, right? So it's going to bubble to the surface. It's going to, something's going to happen and you don't want to snap at people or be revengeful yeah. or, you know, I have a chapter in my book called bitter Betty because I was getting really bitter. And I actually took like six months off of social media because I just couldn't stand seeing happily married couples. I couldn't stand seeing everyone's pretty babies and things like that. And I think that we all just have to realize and give ourselves grace because it's tough and it's ugly and most likely you're not going to have close people in your life that have gone through what you're going through and you just need to give yourself the grace to know that you know what it's okay and I'm gonna mess up I'm gonna fall on my face but it can get better that is that is so true so this is one thing for sure we know that this book does have some elements of humor in it as you yes. just described <laughs> <laughs> and humor is such a huge part yes. in that process of healing too. So, because it's kind of like a release, it's um, because it is heavy, you know, it is heavy and humor is, can be so healing. Laughing can be so healing, you know, mm -hmm. so, what were some of the ways in which you used either humor or laughter or were there certain people in your life that you're like, I'm needing, I'm needing right now to call this sister because this sister is the one that makes me laugh and that's what I need right now. Or I'm needing to call this friend because this is the friend that listens to me during, did you have a pinpoint of people that you would reach out depending on? What oh yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, one of my sisters, the one who's two years older 
And I write this in the book, so <laughs> I don't feel like I don't. I mean, you can probably tell by now. I don't hold anything book, any back, anything back. And like, literally, I'm an open book. I wrote my story for the world, and it was really traumatic. There was a lot of PTSD and pain mm -hmm. going into this book, but I wrote it for other people, so it was worth it. But it was very painful to write. But one sister would be like why do you keep dating? Like, why are you continuing to like put yourself out there? You're just keep getting hurt. Why don't you be, you know, just spend some time by yourself. And I was like, I was working three part-time jobs trying to pay for my house. Like what you were saying earlier, you think you're going to have somebody else help you with your, you know, paper things and all of that. And it was like, I'm by myself all the time. Like, you know, so I would talk to the one sister that would be like, oh my gosh, you're ridiculous. Of course this happened to you. And then the other one would be, the one that I just talked about would be like, I'm so sorry. You know, I wish I could make it different. Da, 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 da. But I, you know, you have different people in your life and it's, it's kind of, um, you know, like I was trying to explain to a child in my life the other day, you know, it's okay to have different relationships with your mom and your dad. And I have different ones with my parents. I'm equally close with both of them. But, you know, you talk to him about different things and it's the same thing with friends. And it's certainly the same thing with, with grief is you go through who is safe, mm -hmm. who you don't have to filter with and things like that. So I definitely did have that. And then the year after he died as well, I did another half marathon and had another new group of friends. And still to this day, one of the people from that one of my coaches, she's 22 years older than me. And I don't know that I would have met her outside of this. And we're going for a walk tomorrow. We go for a walk every couple of weeks. So it's, you know, just putting yourself out there and doing things to surround yourselves with people. And the really tricky thing is, um, and it's made me cry a few times talking about it, is you do lose friends, especially yeah. as a 31 year old widow, you lose friends. After the catastrophic illness, after the big hurrah, the memorial service, funeral, whatnot, people go back to their lives and you're left trying to figure out, I've had a grenade blow up my life. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. And it's not that people don't care, but they're going back to their lives, their families, their spouses, things like that. So you do kind of have to realize, even though it's painful and it hurts and it's not fair that you're going to have your relationships change in your life as well. But ultimately, you know, I feel like God puts people in your life for a reason. And unfortunately, friends sometimes, you know, when you have a job and you have a coworker and you're like friends at work and then you leave that job and you're like, oh, well, we don't really talk anymore. It's kind of the same thing with, with people throughout grief is you're going to lose some people, but you're also going to gain people in this new season of your life that can adequately meet you where you're at. And that's, that was a really big gift. I didn't expect. I, I, okay. I'm like, let, let's just like dissect some of these different points yeah. that you because you mentioned several layers. One was that aspect of course, of the grief component that comes the secondary grief that comes mm -hmm. from all these rela relationships changing. Um, yeah. You mentioned that good friend, you know, of many years that you had, you knew that it was just not a healthy relationship. That was one type. But then also these other friendships that maybe they were your friends when you guys would go out as couples. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, how do you go out with these right. friends, you know, or they no longer contact you because it's the couple dates, you know, date night or whatever as, um, and, and then also just the people, like you mentioned, sometimes people get busy and also too, sometimes people just do not know how to interact mm. anymore because they don't know what to say. They're uncomfortable, um, uh, with their own mortality. I don't know if that, if that makes sense, what I'm saying. I think, uh, I think yeah, I think the biggest thing, like I get what you're getting at, Kendra, yeah. is I had one of the closest friends in my life that's like a sister, she and I were close before, but I was actually hurt that she didn't reach out. And I've told her this. And I was hurt that she didn't reach out to me that much. Mm -hmm. But it turns out she didn't know what to say and she didn't want yeah. to say the wrong thing. So she just didn't do very much. Mm -hmm. And what's tricky is especially when you, I think, not that losing a parent or losing a sibling or something like that is not traumatic, I think the most traumatic things in the world are losing your child and losing your spouse. But when you lose the people that were in your life, in your house every day, people don't know what to say. They really don't know what to say. So they'd rather not say anything in hopes of not offending you 
than saying something and saying it wrong. And that's the toughest part is when you have something awful happen, like we, you know, whenever my parents, my parents are, so I'm the youngest of four. So I'll be 39. I have a sister who's 41, one who's 51 and a brother who's 53. And I'm just scared enormously because my dad's going to be 82. And although he's really healthy, like a 65 year old, like he man, um, <laughs> my mom's going to be 75. I'm We're very dating scared. ourselves by knowing who T man is. <laughs> We're dating ourselves. T man. Yeah. Yeah. I but know. The who thing, is, yeah. Like, oh, but the <laughs> thing is like, because I I'm like, I'm still a baby. I'm only 39 and my dad's going to be 82 to me. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I want him to be around forever. This is not mm-hmm. fair. Mm-hmm. Not that he has health issues or anything, but it's still frightens me. But at the same time, when you're a widow, like I was, you find a lot of your time reassuring other people, which is really annoying because when people are like, oh, I'm so sorry, you you find yourself being like, it's okay. I'm okay. You know, he was sick a really long time. Da, 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 da. And it's just a weird dynamic to be in. So when people don't know what to say and they don't know how to support you, it's almost like you have to say, and I did get to the point, and I talk about this in my book, like you have to get to the point where you're like, please text me, please check on me, please mm-hmm. do this. And I actually have alarm set on my phone to check in with friends and certain people um, once a week or a couple times a week, depending on who that person is, because our lives are so busy, we just forget, right? That's but, such a great tip. I love that tip of just like yeah. checking in with so because they sometimes come to mind. Like I, I normally am like if somebody's name comes to my mind, I right away like send them to hey, just thought of you, even if it's just that. Like it, you know, because there's a reason why that person's name is popping to your head. I yeah. feel, but then the fact of actually putting little reminders. What a great, what a great tip. Yeah, because I mean when. I actually put on Facebook, <laughs> I talk about, talk about this in my book. So I had like, you know, regular Rachel Facebook, but then I also made a healing blog a couple weeks after he died after the service. Cause it was like, I needed to write, I have poetry, I have everything. It's all in the book. And it's cool. Cause I just, I, I'm very impressed with myself and my ability to document all of it back then. Cause it's neat. You can see it all in real life or in real time. But I did say at some point, like, I feel really stupid saying this, but I need people to check in with me. I need you to text me. And I had someone come over and take me for a walk. And when I say that, I mean like a dog. Like I left my dog in my house and she was like, Rachel, put on your shoes. We need to go outside because we need to be able to just be vulnerable. And it's not easy, especially when you've been the person taking care of someone else and you've been the rock. When it's your time, you're like, I'm fine. Da, 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 da. I'm just going to sit here. And, you know, I've told people like when your spouse dies, you don't eat salad. You want cake. You want pasta. You want pizza. So, you know, you don't necessarily make the healthiest decisions. You want comfort, which is fine. But at a certain point, you do have to, you know, pull yourself up and take care of yourself. And in part of that is actually asking for help. And I think that that's a really big thing I try to convey in my book that I knew I wasn't good at some of these things because I've had people say, wow, I read your book and you were great at self-care. And it's like, in hindsight, I knew I should have done that. So that's why I'm trying to promote, like, take care of yourself, even if it's a cup of tea and, you know, posting on Facebook today, I'm having a really hard day and then letting people comment and fill your bucket. That's really important. Uh, That is very important what you're saying because it's sometimes like, one is the actual say the person saying I need help, but also when as a friend of somebody that's going through something hard or as a relative, you can literally just show up or call them and say like, listen, I do not know what to say, or I do not know what to do. Tell me what you need. I'm here because just because of fear of not the knowing what to say Mm -hmm. is uh, and stopping you it's okay to also be vulnerable on the other end and being like listen I really have no words I do not know what the right words are but I just want you to know I'm here and I'm thinking of you and let me know how I can help um that that's important too yeah I think the most valuable thing someone can do is just be there and listen it's free doesn't cost anything doesn't take much time you know, one thing that I would do, um, 
you know, now we've been all stuck inside because of COVID, but it's really easy on the way home from work or while you're making dinner or whatever to just call someone and say, Hey, how are you doing? Da, 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 da. And then, you know, just that 10 minute check-in can make their life dramatically different if they were having a bad day. It's mm. so important. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it doesn't take too long. You know, mm -hmm. it's just to check in. It doesn't, and you could just say, Hey, this is just a quick, quick call. I'm in the middle of making dinner. Just wanted to see how you're doing. Now, yeah. what are some of these other tools? So aside from, you know, your support, uh, reaching out, um, did, you said you are now in, um, support you and a leukemia support group. Did you said that correct? That you're now, um, um, well, what I do is there's actually a local men's group here. It's a caregiver group that I do like a trivia night and I facilitated one of their like clatches support things. So, um, for me, I really distanced myself from the cancer world for years because it was just too close. I couldn't do it. So uh, an example I like to use is no matter how ugly your journey is, which mine got really ugly, um, no matter how difficult it is, think about when people used to go and mine in the Yukon, like in Alaska and Canada, back in the 1800s, they were not wearing their Gore-X, you know, under armor jackets, right? They were wearing like blazers and, you know, hats and not things covering them well or good boots, but they would go up in the middle of nowhere, person behind person behind person, climbing with their little axes in winter storms, hoping to get a couple little nuggets of gold, right? So they could bring that back and be rich. Mm -hmm. In your circumstance, no matter how hard it is, it's not going to make it easier. It's not going to make it prettier. It's not going to make any of it more fair. But just know, I truly believe from the bottom of my heart and soul that everything that you're going through, you're going to get a couple nuggets of gold that mm -hmm. are being mined right now. And you don't even know it. that are going to give you skills to be able to help yourself or help someone else in the future. I had no idea I was going to write a book. I had no idea. I mean, my career and whatnot is advocating for other people, but I was like, no way, no way, dude. I don't want anything to do with cancer. I can't do it. It's too close. Like I have friends that have sick children with leukemia and lymphoma and things like that. And I didn't even want to look at the stories. I didn't want to look at the updates. I didn't want to look at the pictures because it was just too sad, too close. And now I'm like, Hey, here's this little girl today. I'm like, here's Cecilia. She's four and she's had leukemia, you know, twice. Let's help her. Let's have a better world where these things don't happen. And within your tough circumstances, more than likely, you're going to get some skills that will make your life abundantly clear later of, oh my gosh, this happened. Whether it's a coworker or a neighbor or a friend's spouse or whatnot, you can be like, I've been there. I get it. I'm so sorry. And for someone to be able to authentically say I've been there and I'm so sorry and I'm here to listen is the greatest thing that can happen. So just know no matter what your grief is right now, you're going to be able to connect with someone and just blow someone's mind and change their world. And you, I, you know, we're all just going through really difficult stuff and really difficult times, but there are ways to have brighter days. And a lot of it has to do with, are we surrounding ourselves with positive, you know, there's so many like sad and terrible TV shows, movies, music, people in the world. If you can surround yourself with positivity, you know, cut out those things that are negative as much as you can. I actually have a very toxic person in my life that's, I can't get rid of that's in my life for many circumstances, but it's how I choose to react to that, how I choose to support myself, having supportive in my people in my life, a therapist to talk to, all those different things. Just know that those tough things aren't fair, but you're getting things that are going to just blow your mind and be blessings in the future. They really will. And it's, it, it's, not anything I would have ever expected, even being a positive person and then, you know, being slightly pessimistic through the grief and whatnot. I never expected I would be this positive person talking about how I went from, you know, licking the bottom of the barrel and being in despair that my life blew up. And now I'm like, you know what? It's been eight years and I loved him and he was amazing, but I'm okay. And I'm here to tell you that I'm okay. And I wrote this book 
to tell you how I did it with ideas of how you can get through it too. Oh, wow. That is just like that. We should just like wrap it right now with a bow. That was a perfect, <laughs> um, that was a perfect way to kind of segue into closing. But I want to ask you, what yeah. is the Rachel 2.0? How is Rachel 2.0, as you mentioned, different than the Rachel point, uh, 1.0? I'm like 1.1, 1. 1.1, 1. 1. 1. What one point oh? <laughs> I've always been like my mom would always tell me God puts a hand over your mouth sometimes so you don't just say everything that you're thinking. <laughs> but I am very, <laughs> I've been like outgoing and loud and funny sick. my whole life. But I just have this new. I realized like maybe six months a year after he died, like I just don't care what other people think about me, and it's so hard because we're in this Instagram and Facebook and everything just to be authentically yourself and own your experience and own mm -hmm. what it is. And I think that knowing, oh my gosh, my life blew up. And, you know, what was tricky is I didn't want to be connected. I hated high school. I, I lived in a town of 40,000 people. And for me, that was small. And I moved here to the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and wanted diversity and ethnicities and different languages and all kinds of stuff. So I left this small town and, you know, of my class of like 250, 300 people, I talked to maybe 10 of them in the last 20 years. And then when my book was coming out, I Facebook friended all of these people. And when I am humbly coming to them and asking for their money for blood cancer to help people, within my letter, I wrote, and we didn't have reunions or things, you know, because of COVID, I wrote, there's a reason you haven't heard from me in 20 years. And part of it was shame. And not that I was ashamed of my past, but I don't have children. I don't have a happy story. I didn't have a happily ever after. And it's really hard to relate to other people that have not had a significant loss like that. But now I'm like, you know what? I'm here. I'm saying I went through this. I'm okay. And I want to make sure if it's your child, if it's your spouse, if it's your parent, they have the adequate support they need through the Leukemia and the Lymphoma Society. And what's really cool is LLS is also doing groundbreaking research that now is being used for other forms of cancer. So it's not just blood cancer. And it's like every three minutes someone is diagnosed with blood cancer. One out of five people are going to get cancer in their lifetime. Um, you know, kids that have cancer um, are going to grow up and 80% of them have with the current treatments, they're in remission, but their 80% of them are going to have chronic conditions later in their lives. Like that's not okay. My 36-year-old husband, when he was 36, his hip started to collapse because of all the treatments and things that he had that cured the cancer, rotted out his hip. Like, that's not okay. We've got a lot of work to do. But humbly coming to people and saying, you have not heard from me, that's very, that took a lot of courage. And I just had to put myself out there. And I think had I not been through the trauma of the adventure of what I've been on, I don't think I would be authentically just putting it all out there. Mm -hmm. And I have eight more weeks of this campaign to raise $50,000. And I'm just like, I continue messaging people and sending them because if they're going to go on the journey that I am on, I want them to feel adequately supported. And it wasn't until after my husband died that I thought, I just, I don't care. This is my experience. I have to help other people because... I never want anyone to feel as alone as I did. I think that sometimes, like what you just said, like sometimes we go through something so hard because like you were saying earlier, we will be that person that helps somebody else that's going yeah. through that. Um, I see that in just your energy. I feel that in your energy of how... <laughs> how much you want to help others that are going yeah. through this, the book, these organizations that you're part of, all this, you know, um, raising funds and so forth for the research. Uh, it just, it, it sometimes, yeah, there has got to be these warriors out there. <laughs> you're, yeah. Now, you, you mentioned your dad was like He-Man. Well, I think you're She-Ra. <laughs> oh, she thank you. I try. <laughs> She-Ra. Um, do you remember that for the? Oh power my gosh! Yeah, I loved her. Okay, okay. okay. for the. Power, I had someone she, call in at work the other day, and her name was Shira. Oh, she was. <laughs> did she say for the power of grace? Of grace is because I would watch something it like Spanish. that. Yeah. Okay. In 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 span, I would watch it in Spanish. So um, He Man would say like "por el poder de grace" <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm like thinking of that now. So yes, thank you for being that, you yeah. know, that that warrior here of um of being able to bring attention to all these different issues. Now, we will be then posting the link to your website and all these other informations on the show notes. But if you want to just like say it um, just in case. Like yeah. You so you can find Wife Widow Now What, um, the actual book itself on Amazon. You can buy it in paperback where you can actually fill out the budget sheet and different things like that in paperback. And then you can also do um, e version and click on the hyperlinks for the different resources and things. Either way, it's just exclusively on Amazon. And then you can find me, Wife Widow Nawa, on Instagram or Facebook, and you can ask me questions or whatever you'd like. I'm happy to help. Thank you. And then I also have on my social media, um, until May 21st, I'm trying to raise as much money as possible in honor of my late husband and for those that I love and know right now that are battling blood cancer as well. And this is the one that's a 60,000. This is the one that's yeah, 60,000. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, so through May twenty first. Uh, yeah, and the thing is, like, we've I all been. S- I launched this before that. Um, before the it, it expired. It normally takes me about four weeks or so to launch each episode. Sure. So I want to make sure I do that. Uh- <laughs> yeah, and the tricky thing is, we're all sick of wearing masks and hand sanitizers and being stuck at home. But cancer patients have that every day for mm. years. So we just need to, the now more than ever is the time where we have the luxury to do something good for other people. Puts things in perspective, right? Yeah. Like when you know that it's like, yeah, we're complaining about this, but there's others that um, do this all the time, have to do this mm-hmm. all the time. So wonderful. Anything else you wanted to say? Any other last, I know you've said several, you've had a lot of those nuggets of gold in this conversation, as you were mentioned before. So yeah, just that I am so sorry for everyone going through grief experiences, but it's things for, I really do truly believe that despite how horrible you may be feeling or what you're going through, I did it. And I strongly believe other people can do it as well. And things will be okay. Thank you so much for those words. Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me if you would rate and comment on this episode And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.